we've gotten direct death threats. Uh, people have uh, tried to contact conservative slash jihadi type groups about us. We've had to work with the FBI. It's a part and parcel of being in this space. People are regularly killed. I. It's a tough place to be. This is Mohammed Sayed. Along with Sarah Hader, he co-founded the Ex-Muslims of North America, an organization for former Muslims. It's taken many months to get in the same room as them, and I'm beginning to understand why. So, I don't know if you've heard of Abhijit Roy, he's a Bangladeshi, he was a Bangladeshi blogger, he was brutally killed in Bangladesh. I was talking to him a few months before they came at him with meat cleavers and killed him. I finally met with Mohammed and Sarah on the same day as the ex-Muslims' first public event on a Colorado campus. While there, I was a little nervous. What if it turned into some kind of anti-Muslim rally? But more importantly, what if there was an attempt to shut it down? My name is Ayman Ismail. To grow up Muslim means to grow up being feared. So I'm traveling the country to find out for myself if there's really any reason to be afraid of American Muslims. Leaving Islam is still unimaginable for most Muslims, even here in America. Worried for the safety and freedom of people like them, Muhammad and Sarah created a network to support former believers. Even among progressive Muslims, they are harshly criticized. I have to admit, I was one of those Muslims. I first heard about the ex-Muslims through a Twitter hashtag that collected images of people sharing horror stories about their experiences within Islam. It quickly spread through the right-wing internet. Ex-Muslims were held up as the first honest representation of what really happens inside the homes of your Muslim neighbors. Muslims, they don't know what freedom is. I hated that, but that's not fair to ex-Muslims. It's already nearly impossible and sometimes dangerous for them to talk about their experiences. I found that out firsthand when I tried to meet with them. I think we were supposed to meet in Toronto like last month. Yeah, there was an email that was just sent to this the liaison between us and the student group. We talked to the police and we decided that we're going to cancel the event. No, no more detail, no more nothing. The tour itself is called normalizing dissent. And when you're normalizing something, you should expect some pushback. After lengthy back and forths about their security and privacy concerns, they agreed to let us film their first ever on-campus event. Police checked bags at the door for security. They had a backup venue in case they were disinvited. Again. I immediately realized I was wrong to be worried about the event. It was eye-opening and civil for almost the entire time. This topic today, modesty, Islam, and feminism, is kind of a kind of a hot topic. You guys probably notice if you've seen the hijab, especially as something that's very central to the debate about Islam. And unanimously, the panel insisted their stories not be used to fuel bigotry. The stuff that we talk about is very, very easy to be co-opted and twisted, especially by, uh, let's be frank, the right wing. They're using us in order to further their own bigotry, their hatred and, and narrative. And so we have to also somehow reconcile that with the fact that, like, yeah, racism is a force to be contended with when it comes to the, pro the problems facing Muslim communities. So is honor violence. In too many Muslim countries, apostasy is a crime. And in America, it comes with its own risks. For their own safety, Sarah and Mohammed limit their one-on-one -on -one interactions. When they did agree to sit down with me after the event in Boulder, I told myself I mostly just needed to listen. Was there a particular moment that triggered your, uh, your journey into atheism? I remember um, an atheist friend of mine, and he sort of provoked change by, by printing out um, like verses from the Quran. And he said to me, Sarah, justify this. I was like, how dare you? This is insulting. There's an explanation and you just don't understand. So then I, um, I started looking into this because I just wanted to prove him wrong. Like I just wanted him to be <laughs> wrong about this. Oh yeah, yeah. Right? And the more that I started to look at it in an honest way, I found that, okay, there's just maybe not as much there as I thought that was. And the crisis of faith happened and it was all over very quickly, actually. What were some of the things that you were weighing on your mind when you were trying to decide whether or not you wanted to leave Islam? I don't think it's, it works that way. It's either you believe it or you don't believe it. So um, there were lots of flaws that I found over time that were accumulating. And in my mind, I was still a Muslim until at a certain point I had an internal dialogue where it was basically, I know this is wrong. I'm lying to myself. Why am I doing this? I don't believe in this anymore. You know, I, I look at how Islam is practiced all over the Muslim world and I, I feel in my heart that it's very different than the way that I practice. You know, I'm disgusted by homophobia. I consider myself to be a feminist. Uh, do you think I'm being dishonest with myself? So the Gordian knot from my perspective is the Quran is perfect and Muhammad's example is perfect. On the other hand, if we can say that parts of Muhammad's life are no longer to be subscribed to in the 21st century, we move past those ideals, then everything opens up dramatically. 
I actually found myself agreeing with Sarah and Muhammad, but I also wanted to be honest about my earlier bias against people like them. How can I support them when at the same time people are using their stories to validate their prejudice against people like me? Parts of the arguments that ex-Muslims generally tend to make, do you feel as though that they can uh, often be used as fuel for bigotry? If you're even having that doubt that, oh no, I'm at, maybe I'm adding to you know, anti-Muslim bigotry, then you're the right person to, to talk about this. You're the person holding back because you don't want to hurt people. And I don't think many Muslims would agree with me, but I do think that ex-Muslims um, make the bigoted arguments against Muslims harder to make because it actually proves the diversity of people from Muslim backgrounds just by virtue of, of us existing. How do you feel about your, your stuff being used by the far right? Sadly, the issue is that um, they're the only ones that are looking at it because the larger uh, narrative, people don't want to talk about this. So you have the left that should be owning the issue. It's about human rights. It's not about anything else. People should have the ability to choose whatever they want, live however they want, live freely. Um, and most ex-Muslims I know, I would say at least 90% or so, are left wing. If what they're saying is true, then we've swung the pendulum way too far in the other direction. We avoid any criticism of Islam for fear of propping up bigots. By being a vocal progressive Muslim myself, do I provide a convenient cover for liberals to ignore extremists? To the extent that people who are humanitarians but also Muslim deny that religion has a role, uh, they are an obstacle. You have to be able to point out the problem. You have to be able to say, well, it's religious groups and organizations that are the first to present an opposition to human rights concerns, and that is a problem. There are a growing number of reformist Muslims and progressive Muslims, liberal Muslims, I don't know what they what they label themselves, who are, who are willing to be more honest about uh, perhaps in the ways in which religion may have contributed to the problem. And that is helpful. That is, that is, I think, that's something I can get behind. And if I, if I don't agree entirely, at least it's just, I think it's moving in the right direction. I don't agree with everything that the ex-Muslims say. But at the very least, we need to allow Muslims and people who have doubts about Islam to question it. Helping them speak out about what led them away from Islam and actually taking it seriously can improve our faith. I stuck by Islam because I found clarity through confronting my own issues with how it was practiced. Not everyone will. There's this idea that if you leave Islam, you're just no longer moral. You're just no longer a good person. And that's so common and it's, you know, people jokingly talk about like, oh, if my if my sister left Islam, like I would kill her, you know, it's haha, it's very funny. <laughs> Except it's reality for a lot of families that, that do suddenly feel like, okay, well, you don't believe, I don't want anything to do with you. Why isn't this anything Muslims are talking about? Why aren't they advocating for us? Every Muslim should ask themselves this one question. Are we so fragile in our faith as to believe that someone leaving it could shake our own? Back at the panel, we did get a small taste of how Muslims sometimes try to shut down dissent. This one guy kept on interrupting and argued that the women were using their limited experience to demonize all of the faithful. Here's how she responded. I need to ask you to stop right now because this is not your platform. You, 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 get, you posed a question and we're going to address it? Wait, no, 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 I want to say something. This is, we get this a lot, this whole idea that you wouldn't have this stance if you had looked outside the limited perspective of blah 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 context. It is not the way that we should be having these conversations, but it is so often the way that these conversations are had, and we're here right now to change that, which is why we're not giving platforms to this anymore. <laughs>